they were formal papers, of course, they were lucid, they were forceful papers, they were detailed, they were widely researched, you heard all of that, and yet they were trenchant papers of intellectual purpose and with a sense of advocacy in each, uh, each of them. They were also quite dissimilar papers, and focused on two different periods, a narrative of British women artists of South Asian backgrounds organizing and exhibiting their art here in the United Kingdom during the 1980s into sort of 1990, and then the photographic practice and continued misrecognition, as it were, of Lionel uh, Went of Sri Lanka in the early part of the uh, 20th century. What I won't do now, of course, because you just heard the papers and they were so lucid, is I won't present a kind of digest of the papers, but I want to draw um, several things out from them, um, which could become uh, or provide us with a sort of scope for discussion. Um, Alice, I was struck by the way in which um, you talked about these artists, your chosen artist, as existing in a sort of state of slippage, as you put it, between um, India or South Asia and the UK. Um, how Asianness, in that sense, is a kind of is kind of contingent on place, um, asserted strongly here in the UK, perhaps less in South Asia itself. With, as you rightly put it, your artists or some of them saying, "I'm not really Indian, or not really, I might be really Asian, but I'm not really Indian." Um, and in that sense, it seemed to me, I well, I wondered if there was a a way in which you were you were um, alighting on the manner in which those artists um, engage. A, in a kind of st a strategic ambivalence, if you like, um, a category using a category of Asianness, uh, which is discursive, on the one part, and yet sort of um, essentialist or self-essentialist on the other. At a certain point, you talked about blackness. We heard about black womanhood, um, in the context of what you called, I believe, acts of reclamation, empowerment, redefinition, and framed overall by an interest in a kind of feminist politics um, and aesthetics of that period. Um, you'd also talked about the role of uh, regional museums briefly, well, indirectly, Liverpool, Bristol, Colchester. Um, and in an interesting way, sort of photography crept in, which could be my bridge to the, the, uh, the, the next uh, paper. Um, but a question for you, I wonder, I anticipate the question would come, you know, what is the status of Asian British women artists today? Are they still organizing together? If not, why not? How, as a historian, might you go about trying to explain that difference and the transition from then to now? Shane, um, you um, interest me particularly because of the way in which you enlight on different sorts of locations, actually, in a similar sort of fashion. So we have Sri Lanka. We have the notion of Sri Lanka within the wider uh, South Asian or Indian subcontinent, but also the location of, say, modernism, which is something that you're very keen to hold on to in relation to Went, but also other locations, you know, queer aesthetics, um, um, the unstated uh, relation there between uh, Went and his models, for instance, you know, who were his models, um, but also um, thinking perhaps in archival or disciplinary terms or subdisciplinary terms, photographic histories. And those are not simply or not only um, to do with Sri Lanka, but uh, the broader, perhaps a broader global picture for the period um, that you're looking at. So while kind of apparently dissimilar, I think what I do sense is a, is a kind of a common impulse, if you like, or uh, at least a set of symptoms in the area of the approaches that our two speakers have taken to historiography, which it seems to me is about the aim to engage historical study in the task of addressing or rectifying what might be called the sins and the omissions of the past. In other words, to set out as historians to disturb the past by way of our current discourses, and especially, even if the word um, isn't used um, more than tacitly, to undertake a sort of canonization or at least a revisionism of a notionally hegemonic art historical record that sits within and without the nation, to um, use the phrase that, that, that's been um, um, circulating the past two days. So Alice, for instance, talks about struggles for self-representation. Chanet talks about the need, uh, he said in closing, the need for an exhibition or exhibitions that are or that, that are an exhibition that is necessary and urgent. There is a necessary and urgent need 
I was kind of thinking about this, so I'm going to kind of speak a little bit to that before handing over to you. Much of those, the content of those papers, it seems to me, the thrust in that direction, as for much of this conference, in its particular turn towards a history, a history of exhibitions, it may be said, it seems to me, is driven by that very purpose. Uh, to, in other words, take the exhibition as a perhaps necessarily normative form or space or network, or whatever you want to call it, in which to intervene in the understanding of history. Of course, this has been said, and I know this is coming late in the day, but um, uh, bear with me. This is a familiar problem that comes up, though, it must be said, right across the spectrum of fields in the humanities. It's not least in the arts, where the degree of critical attention to the object of study, as we've seen, as we know, can confer value on that object within the horizons of intellectual work and with the potential for wider change in the economy of cultural value. It's not just limited to art history, is it? Where there's a kind of so-called transfer of capital, symbolic, cultural, and so on. And well, I'm quite interested in you know, South Asia and its art histories, the work that I do is um, more focused on um, diaspora communities more widely, and, and a certain amount of work I've done is on the Caribbean and its relationship to the wider Atlantic um, and indeed to its kind of wider South-South sorts of relations. And indeed there in that field uh, of, of my interest, the same problems of canons and canonization are being worked through in some salutary ways. Uh, one of the ways in which I've written about this, um, I thought I would quote from the work I've done on the Caribbean, because if you take the Caribbean stuff out, it could easily be overlaid on what we've been doing uh, here over the past two days. The canon debate I wrote in uh, a book of 20, my book of 2011 has happened without delivery of the guarantees of acceptance and understanding sought by the artists and artworks of recent decades, or going back to 1938 at least. And we are left, I think, with some harrowing difficulties for writing a history of this or any other sort of art. Clearly, canons have a troubling presence. Living with and without a canon um, is equally or equally as problematic and never tenable for all of the time. Any proposed canon for a community of identities for any community of identities, has to stand up to persistent negotiation. And the double bind of emphasizing contested ideas, such as about ethnicity, nation, and culture, as the very grounds for affinity. So the papers we've, you've just heard now are, in a sense, a contribution, it seems to me, to that same collocation uh, of issues. Their authors have placed considerable emphasis and faith on the power or the agency of historiography itself. And therein lies, I think, a difficulty that can only be drawn out through self-reflection and probably a certain amount of group discussion. That is to say, the difficulty of trying to locate, even to falsify the assumption that historical writing can indeed at all have agency. Um, historiography is itself a social practice, and historiography can be studied as such in parallel to concerns with uh, the infrastructures, the networks, and so on, that show its agency to be contingent. But it can have, what can it have, agency in and of itself, I ask. The premise of this conference is really, of course, you know, the answer is, the general answer that emerges is no, it can't have agency in and of itself. Historiography, in most cases, seems to need mobilization, namely through public exhibitions, or in adjacent areas such as art markets. And I should note that we've not really been exhaustive in our search over the past two days, or aimed to satisfy the matter of the limits of the agency of historiography itself, nor the scope or extent of its adjacent discursive and material fields. And where we may have thought about the creation of new publics, such as through exhibitions, or the creation of new markets, um, even eBay came into it, through the exchange of material goods, we have tended, however, not to consider further sorts of social relationships to visual phenomena or artworks that move or unfold outside the existing sort of infrastructures. Our intellectual ambitions, however contextually 
imaginative, experiential, forensic, however much concerned with semiotic or representational regimes in their openness or in their sort of excess, in that regard, I think, have been a lot more modest. I wonder, why is that? Could we press further? If so, how? So that's a general question um, for us all. But for our speakers, I have some quite specific questions in closing. The project of countering or exploding the canon, uh, canons of art, has brought mixed results for the humanities. And you, I'm sure you know that as well as anyone. So why continue, why continue to pursue that project here, as you seem to be doing today? Or rather, since canonization, with recourse to social justice, etc., seems to be the principal goal in each of your papers, how would you try to ensure that the outcomes or the goals that you are seeking are not compromised or undermined? Change the canon by all means, but we still remain in the realm of canonization and its contradictions, among which, obviously, is its inherent or the inherent contestability of these canons. Are we always then, I wonder, to proceed on an agonistic basis, in say Stuart Hall's words, without guarantees, or is there a broader horizon of experience beyond the arguably somewhat narrow range of theoretical interests that characterize art history in its turn to exhibition histories? So two quite simple questions then <laughs> for these artists, <laughs> because these are big questions, but I'll give you some little ones. For Alice with her British artist, the, you know, the hyper-visibility of blackness and difference has led to the ethnicizing or racializing of the field of British art. It led there since the 80s. Perhaps segregating this field along lines of difference in ways that work quite counter to artists' efforts to gain sovereignty through art making. Well, how does your account avoid repeating that pattern? Or how do you account for the historical specificity of those articulations of difference at the time, which have some become, seem to become problematic in the present day. For you, my friend, Sri Lanka, and Lionel went, I wonder how does one avoid the disappointments and the frustrations that come with trying to assert, trying to assert or trying to force this artist into a relation with modernism? Because you use the word a lot. He belongs there and he doesn't, according to some people and in some sense according to you too. So, you know, we can change our definitions of modernism to make that more comfortable for Wendt. <laughs> but we still really remain with modernism and the matter of his inclusion as the mainstay of an attempt to grant this artist's work you know, value and agency, even when modernism is taken to be under erasure or in its, to use that term, anti-foundational form. So my question to you is, what other markers of value would you consider? Are there gains to be made on other fronts? And are they simply and only the stuff around queer aesthetics, stuff about photography? Is there more to it than that? And that's where I'm going to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to follow the tradition that's been established in taking groups of questions. Um, so um, I, I know you've set questions to the, um, our speakers already, but I just want to see and test if there are any questions that we may want to... I think Gita has Ah, Gita, sorry. Um, it's not a question, it's an annotation of your presentation which, if I may say so, is quite brilliant. And I was uh, making notes even before you spoke, and it was not only in relationship to these, these two papers, but many papers over the last two days. Uh, many papers la over the last two days. And so it comes at a point where these papers are addressed, but I think it has to do with several others. Of course, the word archive is uh, constantly being uh, articulated here. And I just wanted to break that word down into um, the empirical, the sincerely descriptive, and an act of retrieval, which is the simpler <coughs> version of archive. If the archive has what was mentioned, uh, the forensic element, then it is about evidence. But evidence would then lead to 
many more extrapolative uh, uh, moves. Yes. And it would be semiotic, as it was said by you. It could be self-reflexive. And therefore, the description would have to be disturbed. Mm. And I, I mean, and, and a sincere historiography is probably um, the least of the methods that we need for addressing contemporary questions. And it, um, uh, I think that you, you brought in the question of agency at the end. And um, I think that it needs retroactive un looking so that we look at these histories which have been recounted over this period of two days and so many other times. We'd have to have retroactive understanding of the m historical moment in relationship to our historical moment. Otherwise, we are making, uh, we're just, this is empirical then. Mm -hmm. And I think too much of this um, project of exhibition histories could be simply empirical mm -hmm. without actually adding anything to the discursive or praxeological moment mm -hmm. for us. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to just hold that question. I can see people scribbling furiously. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to let people gather their thoughts and perhaps in that meantime, uh, maybe take one or two other questions or comments. Um, because I was just waiting for people to just finish oh, scribbling sorry. because I could see, <laughs> I can I'm see people yeah, yeah, people writing stuff down. If there aren't any others, I'll, I will go. Okay, sorry, my, my eyes. I've changed my prescription. Honestly, okay. Uh, just a couple of short observations. Uh, one is uh, that, um, you know, this group of uh, women artists can also perhaps be compared to the group uh, called Saucy in uh, New York, uh, uh, which had a kind of similar agendas. So perhaps a comparative, uh, 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 you know, a kind of a comparative study might be, might well be warranted, okay. Um, also, I mean, I, I liked your paper very much, Alicia, but um, uh, at the end, I, st I felt that you, 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 you know, you, you continued to stress the term of uh, validation through India, but we already talked about, you know, how India is not necessarily the term which should be used, uh, especially in the case of diaspora, where these artists actually come from East Africa and from Pakistan and from, you know, they have various trajectories, so why should we slot them back into a, uh, to, uh, to a touchstone of Indianness, you know? Um, and I, I even think, I think even subcontinent is not a good term. I think South Asia is a much more neutral and better description, you know, um, um, uh, to go. And um, for, uh, for Leon's, you know, comment regarding uh, 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 Shane's, uh, um, the question of modernism, I actually have no problem with, I mean, I see him as a modernist, I have no problem in valuing him as a modernist. So I'm not sure why you want to question that um, project. Oh, I don't. Uh, okay. Oh, I don't, I don't. So I have to say I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, mod mod modernism is the vehicle, isn't it, by yeah. which he's trying to attribute agency to the artist. And I'm wondering if there are other possibilities. I mean, it's sort of generally working, but... Uh, <laughs> okay. We're gonna, we're but, gonna but, but there might be other and better <laughs> options, right? I want to get the last question before people get, um, and then I'll come to a second round. Is that me? Yeah. yeah uh, thank you so much for uh, two brilliant presentations and contribution. Your contribution, Leon. Uh, it's a question for Shane and his paper. And um, I was thinking about some of those uh, portraits, especially, especially the laboring body, and how they really there's an uncanny resemblance with some of the photographs that Sunil Jana took from the 40s onwards, and also Cecil Beaton's own. Uh, take on the laboring body in Bengal. So he has these shots of koi, almost pinups, like men posing in fields. And um, so there is an issue of homoeroticism certainly going on there. But for Jana, it's particularly, it's, it's really uncanny. Like I was wondering if there had been any sort of exchange or perhaps even through things like People's War Illustrated Journal uh, that he might have been, you know, looking into. Uh, in Sri Lanka, perhaps. So, yeah, that's my question. Thank Great. you. Thanks very much. Um, so, can we maybe take that and take them in reverse order? Um, and just, Shana, do you Should want I to take that, that just point about the comparative? Um, thank you for, uh, for your comments. I'm still, my head's still 
spinning. But um, to answer your question directly, Emilia, uh, to my knowledge, I'm not sure that Sunil Jana was aware of Wendt's work because when Wendt passed away, his work really, it took away a particular trajectory and it's been written about. His negatives were burnt by a colleague and while the work did circulate, it, hasn't, it wasn't really, there wasn't, to my knowledge, great awareness of it within the region. And then uh, moving forward to the question of historiography more broadly, and I think to what Gita said, is that conventional modes of historiography just do not seem adequate. And what I'm hoping to, helping to gesture towards or at least work through in this and by raising a lot of different kind of conjectures and instances at which I see went standing, which is from the homoral, looking at it within a tradition of queer work or looking at it from a perspective of photography in the region, but photography more broadly across the medium itself, thinking about him in relation to the modernity projects that were being played out in the region, from painters to people like Kumaraswamy or Minette de Selva who come before and after him. So breaking a kind of traditional idea of historiography and kind of thinking at how many different junctures or interstices that someone like went could arrive at and maybe then the claim towards modernism is not as necessary if he can be read or is being read in different registers, not to privilege one register or the other, but the fact that the multiple registers are possibilities and we are not thinking in those multivalent terms. I just want to go to Alice maybe to take the historiography question and then Leon, maybe you can... Um, shall I respond to the... Um, uh, it wasn't my intention to suggest that this generation of uh, artists were seeking validation from India, so I'm sorry if that's what came across. Um, uh, what I was perhaps trying to well, think of... Absolutely validation as, you know, in relation <laughs> that Not just self-validation, but also validation of right. critics and artists. Yeah, so, so what, I, what I was trying... Yeah, so, so what I'm trying to think through is, is this slippery fish of, of how do we talk about these artists, um, given that I'm coming to their work as an art historian of contemporary British art, and from a British perspective, um, they are uh, defined through some notion of South Asian identity from a... British perspective, um, and whether the rights and wrongs of that are open to question. Um, going to Leon's um, question about uh, why continue to pursue this sort of line of inquiry, um, I would, and whether in my work am I perpetuating an exclusionary discourse of separating out uh, British South Asian women from a broader history of British art history. I'm, I'm very, very aware of that. Um, but I also feel like, or believe, that these histories haven't been written or just talked about. I mean, the four exhibitions that I talked about today are within living memory of lots of people in this room. But I hazard a guess, apart from the artists who were included in them, most people haven't heard of them. Uh, so why is that? Um, and in order to doing, uh, and, and in doing this type of archival forensic research, we can perhaps then lay a foundation or a groundwork which then facilitates a next step of art history, of writing that broader um, narrative of, of British art history. Um, and why continue to pursue this? Well, because there are individual artists who are in this room personally invested. These, these are people living and working now. Um, these are artists who uh, want their work to be recognized um, and want their work and their activities to count for something, actually, and f to have that shift in perspective of what counts as Britishness. Okay. Can I yeah, just 
Yeah, I won't forget. Don't worry. Uh, yeah, well, no, of course, I, I agree with you. Um, these are, you know, not some of the works of art you showed, but certainly works by some, if not many, of the same artists that you're writing about. I'm also writing about, too, but I'm not doing it the way you're doing it um, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and um, so, so I would say that. But the... Um, the business about historiography, I mean, there are conventional forms. You said something about, oh, you know, uh, this isn't a conventional form of historiography because it moves across different sorts of boundaries of nation, da -da 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 -da, et cetera, at all these interstices, as you put it. But the, the basic form, the, the basic concept there is one of biography, essentially. It's about Lionel Went, which is kind of par excellence, you know, alongside a concern with a nation and its art. Is, is the orthodox approach, really, if not you know, one of the orthodox, several small clutch of orthodox approaches to the writing of art history. How does one ensure, really, that your, uh, if you like, appropriation of that form of historiography uh, um, doesn't repeat some of the problems that are associated with, with it and, and, and are fairly well known in the discipline of art history and other disciplines across the humanities, but how do you make sure that you give this thing the sort of counter-hegemonic uh, kind of edge that you want? Um, and this, the, 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 the interesting thing about, you know, that the same question could be asked really of, of the work that Alice is doing, because, um, you know, what, uh, and as Gita says, you know, one needs a retro kind of vision in relation to this. Okay, so this is uh, empirical work based on narrativizing a set of uh, artists um, whose works were, un, you know, are not central or, or even marginal within the national a national discourse on British art. Um, but there is, I mean, what would interest me about the eighty, this kind of, this eighties kind of context really is not biography but the feminist concern with the group and why was it that these women were organizing as women as a group away from male interference or male interest for the most part how does that speak to a particular kind of feminist politics of the time that perhaps has very little to do with the politics of race nation ethnicity um, where is the balance to be struck? Where is the emphasis to be placed? In other words, I mean, when I've read some of the reviews as I have done for, say, the 1990 um, exhibition, um, the feminist uh, responses are quite sort of, they're quite divided, really, in trying to give value to this work. And they're very preoccupied with this split that was there in the language at the time of politics on the one hand and aesthetics on the other. So they could kind of you know, um, commend these w women for the political motivation to come together in the first place, but they couldn't possibly bring themselves to kind of accept that these were works of art of, of, of equal value, if you like, to, And that sort of replays. So there's a, there's a node. Okay, do you know what? I'm just equal value to the other sorts of I'm works that they I'm review. Just take that opportunity yeah. just to, to Hold, because I've, I've probably only got one suite of questions Saloni, left. Charmin, and, and then, so we had... Charmin, Madame. Saloni. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you've been waiting for a long time, so yes, Charmini. Okay, and then we we'll go. Hi, yes. I just want to say something really short. Um, it's just that a lot of this, the women artists that were talked about didn't necessarily wish to be put into that label of being women artists or black artists. And even at that time, before that time, after that time, several of women artists of South Asian origins here or from other origins were actually being assimilated into, in quotes, mainstream venues, places like the Tate, were showing some work by the same women artists, Arts Council England collecting work. So it's not that simple a story. And there's another story, you know, another another story of women whose work isn't overtly political, even though it's often said the personal is political. Sorry, Absolutely. that's thank that you. Was it. 
Yeah, that's really useful. The more stories, the better. Saloni. I'll, I'll make a, a quick comment as well. Um, I think the uh, challenges that both Leon and Gita have posed are extremely um, stimulating and important uh, and critical. And one other way that I understand it, uh, it just maybe echoes off of, off of what you've both said much better than I, is uh, what Gita uh, called uh, a sincere historiography, not a conventional historiography. A sincere historiography is not adequate to the task. And to me, that connects with Leon's question of the canon. A sincere historiography makes the inclusion-exclusion uh, claim. It's too sincere. Uh, Alicia, with all due respect, your key argument was that British art history should, seems to me, give more credibility to South Asian women artists. I don't think, I guess for me the problem is there's no way to argue that claim with that claim. I think we all agree with that claim. The inclusion claim is too sincere to the point of banality. Give me a claim we can argue with, right? <laughs> the inclusion claim is unarguable, right? So what other, I think, I think this seems to me what Leon was trying to say, what other kinds of narratives, right, can we generate? Uh, and I think Gita's saying something more pyrotechnic, please, or something. <laughs> There's a lot of pyrotechnics in this room. Um, uh, thank you so much for that. That's insightful. What I'm going to do, because I have pressure of time, that I'm going to take two more comment questions and then leave it to our panel to choose how they want to respond. So. Um, well, are there other narratives, I suppose, from my perspective? Um, Leon, you said, is there more to it? And you described the papers as being um, intellectual, which they were, and um, you also said they were, they were advocatory. What, what, where is the advocacy? What is it for? And there's the mention of the canon, which you in various ways sort of questioned and were dismissing. But is there, is there a reason to create the canon towards, and my question is for Shanai, to give value to Lionel Went in terms of the art market? Um, and my question really is for you, it's a difficult one, but is there a conflict of interest, Shanai, in the your scholarship that is being now accrued through a paper like this, does it then give value through what it is also talking about to your cousin who is selling Lionel Wentz's work in a gallery in India from a collection from an Indian collector that left Sri Lanka in the 90s from a source that was bought from my research through the archive, sometimes the archive produces things we don't want to know. And I don't think that that work, as many people who are doing work on Lionel Went are beginning to, to see, was legitimately there to be sold. So my question is one, of, is there a conflict of interest? Okay, great. And I'm just gonna hold that and take the last point here, and then we'll go. Sorry, it's just a question to Shane. Thank you, I enjoyed your paper a lot. You know, it reminded me of a paper I heard recently by Nachi Keth Chachani in a different context. And he was talking about uh, Kumaraswamy's photo uh, you know, photography in the early 1920s. I wonder if you are uh, in dialogue with that body of material and whether that body of material is relevant at all uh, for the work uh, Lionel Vent is doing because I see resonance there both in the use of classical uh, sculpture and nudes. So I guess that's the question. Great, thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Okay, so last comments then from our panel. Okay, so um, I will um, uh, respond to Sanjukta and Charmini. Um, Sanjukta, I'm a, I've just recently become aware of that body of work, so it's, it's really interesting for me to kind of think of it, not only in relation to Wen's photographs, but also say someone like Umrao Singh Shagel or a whole host of other male self-portraiture or portraiture from that time, which was working with tropes of self-fashioning, which is something that I have 
been researching. So, yes. Um, so now to Sharmini's question, which I'm, I mean, it's, thank you for the question. It's one that should be asked. We are, the art world is seemingly small and I am related to my aunt who is selling his work. Um, so to say, to suggest that, well, there are two things. One, my interest in Wendt is, come, I come at Wendt from perhaps two or three different perspectives, which are quite personal. One is the queer, one is self-fashioning, and the other is cosmopolitanism. These are questions which I've been investigating well beyond before Amrita picked up on Wendt's work. It's the core of my thesis, and there are other artists in there. And so I feel that the knowledge of Wendt in terms of that broader field of questioning and research that I'm doing, I want to include him within it because I do think that he has a place in it for me and it does become, I, I feel a resonant, I feel resonant with the work. In terms of a conflict of interest, I, I mean, I have to navigate this in my own career and it, I do, don't know if my scholarship is that important that it actually attributes any kind of value to anything. But if one were to believe it, um, I, I would then have to acknowledge that yes, then I am participating in a neoliberal economy that is adding value to something that someone I know is going to benefit from. To speak to the ethics of how those pictures left Sri Lanka and how they arrived in the collection which she's working with, I think that's more of a question for her because I'm not involved in the sale of those pictures, I'm not dealing with them, I'm not placing them in collections, I'm not involved in the commercial aspects of it at all. So I think that's more of a question for her, but I've just come to the material, I'm looking at the material that she has, but then I'm also looking at material that is with Ton Peck in Utrecht, I'm looking at Menel Francesca's research, so it's not just that she's the singular source that is feeding me the material that I'm researching on. And so my, my point really is that Wendt is part of a broader part of, a, a, he's part of a, a broader forum of research that I have been doing, and I feel comfortable in claiming that he fits and sits in that well enough, not only to be that I'm working to create value for her. Final comment, Salis? Um, yes, thank you, Salini, for your comment. And, and I uh, absolutely agree. Um, and, I, uh, and yes, uh, in some ways, it is a simplistic argument to say um, that we should acknowledge these artists. But the fact that these exhibitions haven't been as yet acknowledged, I think, also needs to be acknowledged. No, um, no we should not acknowledge these artists. It's unarguable. Yes, no, no, and I, and I agree. Um, and, and I suppose I, what I would say was, was, is that in this particular presentation, um, my aim was to map out a groundwork of exhibition histories, um, which tells a particular story, um, and from which we, I, my, in my research and perhaps other people in the room can then expand it outwards, um, that this is just the beginning of a larger body of research that's being undertaken. So this, yeah, I wouldn't want to say that this is a full stop. Thank you so much. Thanks to uh, you as an audience for those, for those questions. And let's uh, thank our panelists for their responses. Thank you so much.